The world's first reported oil well was drilled in 347 A.D. in China. Using bits attached to bamboo poles, that first well reached a depth of 800 feet. In 1859, Pennsylvania laid claim to America's first oil well, but at the same time, Lewis Ross struck oil in the Cherokee Nation while deepening his saltwater well. Oklahoma's oil boom is largely believed to have begun in Bartlesville with the first commercially producing oil well. But if you talk to people in Chelsea, they'll tell you that well actually came in second. In a park near downtown Bartlesville stands a replica of the Nellie Johnstone No. 1, Oklahoma's first commercially producing oil well. In April of 1897, George Keeler and William Johnstone produced a gusher. Bill Johnstone is a great-grandson. I suspect it surprised him, and so it really had to be a little terrifying whether they could control what was happening, and plus, you know, I'm sure the imagination started drifting as to what else this could lead to. The Nellie Johnstone No. 1 led to an oil boom that put Oklahoma in charge of the nation's oil supply through the early 1920s. Using actors, a video produced to raise money to develop Bartlesville Discovery One Park gives visitors an idea of what it was like for people who worked Oklahoma's first oil patch. The reality is far different. For the men who toiled on those creaky wooden derricks, the work was dirty and dangerous. It also meant long hours and all kinds of weather, but the lure of oil was impossible to ignore. I know that George Keeler and William Johnstone, two traders who had come to the Indian Territory in the 1870s, had seen an oil seep on the Caney River near what is now Bartlesville, Oklahoma. Dr. Bob Blackburn is executive director of the Oklahoma Historical Society. He says just getting materials and supplies to the site was a major undertaking and drilling technology was primitive. A cable tool rig literally pounded a hole in the ground. The driller would, would reel it up and then let it go and bang, it would hit and he would turn it and it would bang a hole. About 1,500 feet was it. And the Nellie Johnstone number one was also one of the first wells in the state to be fracked. One of the significant parts of the story of the Nellie Johnstone number one is fracking. We hear fracking today like it's brand new, and but it was there in 1897 when they drilled the Nellie Johnstone number one. But the way they did fracturing back then no doubt caused some collateral damage. Then in those days, fracking was with nitroglycerin, you know, the stuff that makes things explode. As shown in this reenactment at the replica Nellie Johnstone One Rig in Bartlesville, nitroglycerin was poured down the hole and then came the go devil, the tool that would cause the explosion to fracture the formation that held the oil. And using a high explosive to open the formation was often done more than once. And once in a while, the formations would tighten up, they'd have to go back in and do another round of fracking to keep the production going. And they kept that well alive and producing until the 1940s. Even the technology for putting out oil storage tank fires was primitive. Because the old wooden tanks vented fumes into the air, lightning storms could produce some huge fires. To avoid rolling balls of flaming oil, cannons like this one were used to blow a hole near the bottom of the tank to allow the oil to flow out and the fire to burn out. Even acquiring the mineral rights to drill was difficult because it meant dealing with Indian tribes. The Cherokees and the Osages and the Creeks. Before allotment, you had to go through the tribal apparatus. You had to go through the Bureau of Indian Affairs to get a lease. In the 1890s, there was little demand for oil, and the lack of roads and rail lines made getting the oil to market nearly impossible. Soon after the Nellie Johnstone won struck oil, it had to be capped because there was no way to get it to the refinery in Kansas. Even though it would produce more than 100,000 barrels of oil in its lifetime, there was no market for it on the south bank of the Caney River. There was no Bartlesville. There was no Tulsa. Uh, there was no, no town closer than Muskogee. Well, not until 1899 did a railroad build through that area, allowing them to put the oil onto tank cars to get it to the markets. But once the oil train started running, the Nellie Johnstone No. 1 went into production. But there is one more twist to the story of Oklahoma's first commercially productive oil well. Not far from Bartlesville, along a winding road outside of Chelsea, 
you see the sign and then drive up to this. A man named Edward Byrd secured a drilling lease from the Cherokees for nearly 100,000 acres of land and set about drilling for oil. He found it in the pasture just behind this display. The well was only 32 feet deep and produced just over a barrel a day. The site eventually contained about a dozen wells, but like the drillers of the Nellie Johnstone, Mr. Byrd had no place to market his product and eventually abandoned the wells. There are other monuments to Oklahoma's oil history, like the first Main Street well in Barnsdall, and what is believed to be the state's longest producing well, the Wheeler No. 1, which struck oil in March of 1912, about 100 years later, it continues to pump about six barrels a day. But it was the Nellie Johnstone No. 1 that gets the credit for launching Oklahoma into the energy industry. Nellie Johnstone No. 1 is the first story in that sequence. Glenpool is very important because that brings the oil community here. But then after that, Oklahoma is an oil state. And as I often say in my speeches, without oil, Oklahoma is Arkansas. According to a new report from the Oklahoma Energy Resources Board, the oil and gas industry now supplies $61 billion a year to Oklahoma's economy. 